Cough shock number one. And then under the picture of the musketeers, Kislov, K-S-L-O-F number two, and then Gook number three. Those are the three musketeers. They're very important, covering up something that uh, happened in 1957, dealing with Popoff, um, actually two moles, Popoff's mole and then the mole revealing that Popoff what had, uh, had betrayed the KGB. So the action is old in the lower left-hand corner. At the top, you see the three good uh, genuine defectors, Popoff, Penkovsky, and Golitsyn, who came over. Uh, and this caused Angleton, especially Popoff's revelations about the U-2 compromise, led to the mole hunt. There's a picture, a funny cartoon of the mole in a trave. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And then um, the, the events that were prompted by that mole hunt, the defection of Oswald, which I believe was false. I'll talk about that and how the real action inside the CIA worked and helped that by subverting the normal paper trail and, and so on. Uh, Blunt figured out, a lot, so, and so did I in, in uh, Oswald, the CIA, a lot of what happened in the paper trail. Uh, inside, uh, the pop-off def uh, defection caused uh, hell to be rained down on the KGB. The head was moved out, Schleppen moved in. Uh, the, and the same thing happened over in the military intelligence side. We're looking at the first chief directorate and the second chief directorate, the deception, the deception organizations within them. Agayance in, in the first chief directorate and Grebenoff in the second chief tra trajectorate. Both of those guys wanted Kondrashev, their number one counterintel guy during the Cold War. Uh, Agayance warned not to go with Grebenoff and he, he followed that advice and he went to work for Agayance. And, um, Later on, after the Cold War was over, uh, he became close friends with Pete Bagley and confirmed a lot of stuff. Bagley was the one who had to figure out what's down there in the lower hand corner. Very hard to do because Grebenov sent Nosenko to uh, take us off the trail. So that's a, an overview. I'm gonna be giving you a lot of the details now, but I just wanted you to get that much and be able to follow the, the chart. And if you forget a name, take a look at your sheet or, or an organization. Okay. Here we go. So in 2017, I released Countdown to Darkness, the second volume in my new series on the Kennedy presidency. And in the first chapter, so this is new, it hasn't been published yet, uh, I reconsidered the case for a false defection of Oswald to the USSR in 1959. Um, 22 years ago, in my work, Oswald and the CIA, that was the first time that I seriously examined the possibility that Angleton might have orchestrated uh, the dispatch of Oswald as a provocation, a dangle, to help surface a KGB mole in the CIA. Should be slide three. Slide three. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. This is it, isn't it? No, one more. <coughs> the implications of a false defection scenario fundamentally affect, in important ways, our understanding of Oswald's behavior in Japan, his reason for leaving the Marines, his 59 defection in Moscow, his 62 redefection to the United States, and his presence in Dealey Plaza the day Kennedy was assassinated. Here we go back to the default slide. Default slide for a while. Zero. His 1959 defection was an important episode in the CIA KGB spy wars for many years during the Cold War. His activities in New Orleans and Mexico City in the summer and fall of 1963 ignited an intense new chapter in that struggle. I now understand that the espionage and counterintelligence games taking place from 1953 to 1964 are the essential backdrop that permits us to understand Oswald's journey during that period. Lee Oswald became, to borrow a metaphor, an extremely important pawn on the Cold War chessboard. We'll go on to slide four. Two moles relevant to the US, USSR ICBM race. In January 1957, Vladislav Kovchuk, down in the lower left hand corner of your flowchart, a KGB officer who was in charge of the KGB's work against the American embassy personnel in Moscow, traveled to the Soviet embassy in Washington under the pseudonym Komarov. That will be important later. Not until the end of the Cold War did a CIA spy master named Tenet Pete Bagley learn from former KGB spy master Sergei Kondrashev the reason for that trip. Kondrashev had gone to America to communicate with the KGB. Pop off. 
We are uncertain of how many details about Popoff's treason that the KGB mole was able to convey to Kovchak on that trip. But we do know that Popov had been passing sensitive Soviet secrets to the CIA since late 1952. And as fate would have it, about 15 months after Kovchak's discovery of Popov's defection, in April 1958, the CIA learned from Popov himself about the KGB mole in the CIA. These two events were in close proximity with each other and led to this big war that went on intense war between the KGB and the CIA, and then later within the CIA on whether or not Nosenko was bona fide or a false defector. Popoff had overheard a drunken GRU officer state that the mole had betrayed the full technical details of the CIA's super secret U-2 spy plane. That airplane could fly at 80,000 feet above the ability of Soviet radar to pinpoint its location and shoot it down. The primary mission of the U-2 as it flew over Soviet territory was to collect data on the USSR's ballistic missile developments. At the time, the US and USSR were in a race to develop nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles. Let's go to slide five. Basically, you're looking at a war between Gribanov and Angleton as this thing unfolds. Um, Gribanov is deception, Angleton's counterintelligence. Those two events, Popov's bombshell about the KGB mole and Kovchuk's bombshell about Popov's treason kindled one of the epic counterintelligence battles of the Cold War. The counterintelligence chiefs in the KGB and the CIA locked horns as both of them undertook actions to neutralize the successful penetration by the other side. This becomes very complicated. <clears throat> in the spring of 1958, Angleton put into motion a trave to trap the KGB mole. Now, a trave is a word for an inescapable frame to confine an unruly horse or ox for shoeing and a suitable counterintelligence term for neutralizing a mole. Angleton's plan began with the false defection of Lee Harvey Oswald, a marine radar specialist who had been tracking the U-2 flights over Russia from Atsugi, Japan. There's a picture of the plane there. Next. Slide six. There it is. At exactly the same time in the spring of 1958, Major General Oleg Grivinov, head of the uh, Military Intelligence Counterintelligence, the second chief directorate, put in motion a complicated, what he called, grand deception strategy that would enable the KGB to isolate, trap, and arrest Popov. The immediate problem was that if the KGB arrested Popov straight away, this would endanger their mole in the CIA. Therefore, Grivinov's strategy was to wait until Popov could be arrested without exposing the Soviet mole. Over the course of 1958, Grivinov arranged a series of deceptive events, none of which were related to the mole in the CIA. These events would be used as the excuse for arresting Popov. With the completion of several of these, uh, of these restrained preparations, in December of 1958, Popov was ordered to return to Moscow from Berlin on a ruse and was arrested upon his arrival. Ivan Sirov, number seven. With Popov in Gribanov's trave and unable to escape to the West, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was free to do as he pleased. Heads rolled in Soviet intelligence over the Popov affair. Khrushchev demoted KGB chief Ivan Sirov, <clears throat> sending him to become the head of the GRU. That's military intelligence. At the same time, Khrushchev promoted Alexander Shalepin to become the new chief of the KGB. But in sending Sirov to the GRU, Khrushchev planned to use him to shake up the GRU and then fire him too. Default slide again. Popov was quietly arrested. His contrition in the initial interrogation led to the KGB's decision to double him back against the CIA in Moscow for several months. That strategy gave the KGB enough time to organize a safe return to the USSR of the GRU illegals that Popov may have compromised. Soviet military and foreign intelligence relied heavily on so-called illegals. They were Soviet bloc intelligence officers falsely documented as foreign citizens who were sent abroad to conduct intelligence operations. The illegals were also the most important counterintelligence targets. Popov was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death. He was executed by firing squad in June 1960. But for six years, Popov trundled bales of top secret information out of the secret centers of Soviet power. 
In the process, he shattered the Soviet military intelligence service, caused the transfer of the KGB chief of four-star general, one of the most powerful men in the USSR, and saved the United States half a billion dollars in military research. So now I'm going to turn to more. Uh, yeah. Several months after Popov's U-2 warning, around September of 1958, Oswald allegedly began studying a Berlitz grammar book to teach himself Russian in his off-duty time. Angleton's plan to surface the suspected mole in the Soviet Russia division was designed to provoke, to provoke the KGB to communicate with their mole who had betrayed the U-2 program. Angleton's search for U-2 flypaper to dangle before Soviet intelligence would have required enough time to spot and assess available candidates for such a provocation. At that time, Oswald was working in a marine radar unit in Atsugi, Japan, MAX-1, as the unit was called. It tracked the CIA's U-2 spy flights over the far eastern part of the USSR. Oswald's work, therefore, made him a potential candidate. The four- to five-month interregnum between Popov's U-2 tip-off and Oswald's interest in learning Russian seems about the right amount of time to select him for the job. <clears throat> On 3 September 1959, Oswald requested and was granted a compassionate early discharge from the Marines. This was ostensibly to tend to his ill mother, Marguerite Oswald, in Fort Worth, Texas. But after spending just three days with her, he made a beeline for Moscow. Let's go to uh, slide nine. Yeah. Oswald arrived in Moscow on 16 October, <clears throat> 1959. He had already asked USSR officials to grant him Soviet citizenship before he walked into the U.S. Embassy in Moscow to defect on Halloween Day, 31 October 1959. According to the two American embassy consular officials who witnessed the event, we got nine up there? Yeah. Uh, Richard Snyder uh, on the right and John McVicker on the left, and to the American journalist Priscilla Johnson, who interviewed Oswald afterwards, his performance was very well rehearsed, and he knew, he knew exactly what to re expect. Many researchers, Peter Scott and myself and others, have set forth <clears throat> the minute details of Oswald's confrontation with Snyder, but in the interest of time, I will be unable to repeat all of that here today. But there are just two points about Oswald's performance that day in the embassy that I do want to emphasize. First, the extensive preparation of Oswald for this moment indicates that he stood, understood, that the consular office was bugged when he declared he was prepared to tell the USSR what he had learned about radar and, quote, something special, unquote. The KGB would have understood that remark as a reference to the CIA's U-2 program once they discovered, as they quickly would, his marine assignment in Atsugi, Japan. He was covertly debriefed in Moscow twice. And, I'll, and, and other points I'll, I'll bring up later. Secondly, the other thing is that in his long interview after, afterward with Priscilla Johnson, Oswald withheld, the, he told her everything, but withheld the most radioactive detail of all about his performance inside the embassy, the bait he had dangled about knowing something special about the U-2 program. That particular missing piece would play a crucial role in how the hunt for Popov's mole played out in the documentary trail in the CIA in the spring of 1960. Using Oswald as a lure in the Soviet Union was only the beginning of Angleton's larger strategy for uncovering Popov's mole. Angleton hoped Oswald's defection in Moscow would trigger the real action inside of the CIA. The reason I raised the possibility of a false Oswald defection in 1995 was due to the highly irregular dissemination of documents from other government agencies about Oswald inside the CIA after his defection. Oswald's CIA paper trail was irregular to the extreme. Okay, slide 11, we're going to need relevant CI components. We, we didn't slide didn't pass that one, did you? Right here. This is what you want now? Yes. Okay, this is just before the fact started. And what we have here are three areas that I'm... John, do you want the picture? Uh, okay, the sure. Just that one right at the top. Okay, got it. So I've, uh, uh, here, here are the incoming records. They go to a place called the Records Integration Division. There's other Office of Mail Logistics. But anyway, this is the, 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 the door through which all external documents are coming. 
And we've got three areas we're concerned with. Here is the Directorate of Plans, the covert side of the CIA. And we're particularly interested in the Soviet Russia division, since this is about Soviet Russia, <clears throat> and, uh, and also SR6 Soviet realities, which would do the biographic files if the, when these documents come in. And they would probably be the ones who would open a 201 file on Oswald. In the middle here, we have the counterintelligence staff. And here's Ann Edgeter in, in, uh, in the uh, Special Investigations Group. That's the mole hunting unit. And uh, Popwell's mole somewhere down here and maybe a cutout. And over on the other side, we have the Office of Security, and in particular, the Security Research Staff, SRS. Okay, next slide. So, let me come back here for a minute. The normal internal dissemination procedures of other uh, government documents um, would be like this. These, the Records Integration Division would bring it in. They would send it to the s several Soviet elements in the Directorate of Plans. Uh, both information and action copies would also have been sent to the relevant security and counterintelligence components. The principal officer behind the mole hunt would have been the counter would have been uh, Angleton, but the strategy was a trap. Popov's mole it was a joint effort between mole, his mole hunters and the security research staff, and the office of security. Together, they created the trade with which they hoped to trap the mole. They would have done this before any information about the defection began to flow, and had to be before the arrangement had to be set in place. They would have coordinated with Records Integration Division, the Office of Mail Logistics. They would have cut off the incoming traffic to all of the components in the DDP, restricted access to that traffic to the SRS, prevented the normal opening of a personality to two on file on Oswald and the components of the Directorate of Plans, placed Oswald on the mail intercept list, and waited for the KGB to prompt their mold to fall into the trap by requesting information on Oswald. That was the plan. Now let's see how it worked. Ooh -ooh. Get in there. Okay. Next slide or this slide? Yeah, next slide. That's just a little cartoon. That's the U2 flypaper and there's the, the mold of the trap. Okay, let's go to the next one. I just read that. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay, here we are on 30 October. That's the day before the first, uh, 31 October was the day of defection and the first uh, cables from Moscow came the next day. So let's go to the next slide. Boom, right here is the beginning. OS 351164, they opened up a, a security file on Oswald, okay? And by that time, we had two or three documents, and by the time we get into early November, we had about six or seven from all over the place. Uh, they were shared with a uh, special investigations group, CI SIG, the mole hunters. But notice there's nothing going on over here, and that's where it should have been going. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is 9 November now, and the next big development that's happened is that uh, the mole hunters have opened a, uh, uh, a file, a, mo a mail opening. Um, they're opening his CI Project RE. The RE, by the way, it took me years to figure it out, is Ruben Ephraim is, is what that stands for. That's his name. Um, so they're, they're going to open his mail. <clears throat> Still nothing going on over here. No 201 file on the mail opening intercept list and only the documents uh, are all collected over here. Let's go to the next one, that's 9 November. There's the uh, card where Ruben Efron opened the uh, mail opening project, next one. Okay, now we're gonna fast forward to the spring of 1960. <coughs> and for the first time, they, the mole hunters and, and SRS decided to drop one crumb of information over here, just one crumb, that's all. And what it is, is Priscilla Johnson's uh, article. And of course it's missing the, the, the radioactive piece, right? Um, so that goes over to here, uh, and also it's shared here. And so this is the state of affairs uh, by the spring. Um, now, if you were working in, in the Soviet Russia division, you saw the newspapers it was in all the newspapers, the defection, right? And so what you would have done probably is do your own little clippings and have them in your desk drawer. But you would wonder why your whole division hadn't seen anything all this time, a half a year, more than eight months has gone by. So nobody was asking anything because it was really obvious that there was something going on, okay? And so nobody messed up. 
and ask for any information because they, they realized that it wasn't their call to make, okay? So some, that's what's going on here. We don't have a memo about that, but that's obviously true. Uh, there's just so many uh, n newspaper clippings, and we have them actually now. They're CIA documents and the newspaper clippings all through this period. But uh, everybody probably had a couple of them, especially in the biographic uh, branch. So this is the way things remained um, until, let's go to the next slide and see where we, where we are. Okay, all the way till the end of the year, nothing. This is an interesting uh, uh, comment that Dick Helms made uh, under oath to the HSCA. Uh, we're, we're moving now to the time that the uh, 201 file was finally opened in December of um, 1960. And uh, there's a lot to, to say about it. I'll try and confine myself to just a couple of minutes. Anyway, Helms said um, under oath, uh, he, he, he couldn't imagine why. He couldn't imagine why it would have taken an entire year. I am amazed, he said. Defect to the USSR in October 1959, and this is December 1960? There wasn't a 201 file already in existence? I'm amazed. Are you sure there wasn't? I, think he's, he's, I don't think he's, he's bullshitting here. He was the D, he, what he was was head of the DDP. And they, the, the mole was thought to be in the DDP. So why would you tell the head of the DDP about this mole hunt? I don't think he was jeeped in on it. It makes sense. More than that, that, that is, you know, why he would perjure himself uh, for no reason. Helm's astonishment was not disingenuous. During the 14 months before personality to one file was finally opened. Okay, I just said that. Okay, go to the default slide and let me talk for a little bit. There's no question but that the Soviet Union was extremely disturbed by the CIA's U-2 overflights of its territory and was anxious to acquire information on how to shoot down the aircraft. Yet the mole trap was set and the bait was not taken. That did not mean, however, that the KGB had no interest in what Oswald might know about the U-2 program. On the contrary, as we found out after the fall of the Soviet Union, the KGB's interest had been significant enough to covertly debrief him often watch him very closely, bug his apartment in Minsk, and open his mail, and use his co-workers as informants at the radio factory where he worked. Yeah. Oh, just hold on. Uh, in any event, uh, we, we now know that the KGB's interest in Oswald was not sufficiently aroused to, seek, to risk exposing their mole. Moreover, from Angleton's perspective, that would have meant that Popoff's mole was extremely valuable, more than he had figured. And that revelation only served to heighten Angleton's angst. Answers to the questions about the mole's identity and why he or she was so valuable would elude Angleton for the remainder of his life. After Anatoly Galitsyn's defection in December 61, Angleton would realize what a prized KGB asset that mole really was. He would eventually become so preoccupied with finding Popov's mole that it destroyed his career and those of many other talented officers in the Soviet Russia division. At the end of my presentation, I will tell you how we know that the mold, in fact, existed and was never uncovered. Okay, Barry and Meal. Thank Peter Dale Scott here for trying to get me to talk about that 25 years ago. Uh, a barium meal is a mixture of barium sulfate and water, opaque to x-rays that is swallowed to permit radiological examination of the stomach or intestines. As Peter Scott wrote long ago, in spied Traycraft, it is false information, marked cards, inserted into the documentary record to search for a hostile espionage penetration. <coughs> Oddly enough, from Angle Angleton's perspective, the first request for information of, on Oswald's defection did not come from the CIA's Soviet Russia division. Rather, it came from the State Department more than a year after Oswald's defection. On 3 November 1960, CIA Deputy Director Plans Bissell replied to a request for information on Oswald and 11 other American defectors from the State Department's Intelligence and Research Office. By that time, the CIA mole hunt had still failed to surface the mole. Angleton had been arranging a series of marked cards for the Soviet division to test Popov's assertion that the mole had betrayed the U-2 program. Now Angleton seemed to be testing the State Department and anywhere else that the CIA response to that request might end up. Crafting a response to that request was therefore assigned to Angleton's mole hunting unit, the Special Investigations Group. The chief of that unit, Birch O'Neill, forwarded the response to Bissell but the desk officer who actually assembled it was Ann Edgeter. In addition, she also opened the personality to one file on Oswald. 
The draft of her response to the State Department was word for word nearly identical to the May 1960 soft file in the Soviet Russia Division's biographic branch that I showed you a few moments ago. As I explained, the soft file was based on Priscilla Johnson's news article after describing her November 1959 interview with Oswald in Moscow. I devoted an entire chapter to that crucial episode in volume two of my series on this case. I can only recapitulate a few aspects of it here. Slide 22, editor's routing slip over the Stacy soft file. This odd dating system here with the month in the middle and a Roman numeral was Ann Edgeter's uh, trademark. Um, this is the Stacy Saw file from May, but this is uh, whatever I said it was, December the 9th, is, when she's opening the 201 file on Oswald. And this is her handwriting, and by the way, when, when you take the real document and hold it up to the light, you can see all the names in here. So we know it's, it's, it's Margaret's, uh, Betty Stacy here, and Margaret Stevens up here in SRS, and so on. So she is writing the open, 201 opening file, looking at the real name, Lee Harvey Oswald in here, and putting Lee Henry Oswald on the 201 opening and on the, doc, the document sheet that opened it, and, and, and another card. She, in fact, <clears throat> as editor prepared her biographic uh, sketch on Oswald, we know for a fact that she was working for the B Betty Stacy uh, saw file. <clears throat> but the sketch that Edgerter wrote was an exact match with two notable exceptions. Edgerter stated that Oswald had actually renounced his American citizenship in Moscow, whereas Johnston and Sacy did not say that, and Edgerter was fully aware that Oswald had not renounced. Edgerter changed the name to Lee Henry Oswald, whereas Johnston and Stacy used the true name, Lee Harvey Oswald. While the renunciation issue is significant, the middle name Henry is far more important, and I will take you through how Edgerter used the wrong name. Throughout the five-week process of responding to the State Department request for information on Oswald and the opening of his 201 file, Edgerter scored a perfect four-for-four four record. She always used the name Lee Henry Oswald and never mentioned his true name. Edgerter's false Henry was a barium meal, a marked card placed in the documentary trail to hunt for the mole. Next slide, 23. Um, Moreover, as I will show you shortly, Edgerter scored perfectly again much later downstream when Oswald was in Mexico City in the fall of 1963. In spite of all the documents in Oswald's security file and his 201 file at that time, using his true name, Edgerter would sign off on both of the CI cables that used Henry instead of Harvey for Oswald's middle name. She never used the name Harvey, always, whether it was 1960 or 1963. Let me take you on a trip through the relative, re relevant declassified documents for Edgeter's clearly deliberate use of the wrong middle name. Okay. Yes, please. It's going to be 24 through 20. We'll start with 24. I'm going to just ad lib this stuff now. Next one. Okay, this is, uh, this is the soft file, Lee Harvey Oswald, okay? And go to the next one. And th that's the bio that Stacy wrote. Uh, keep going. Okay, this is Ann Edgerter's version. And she uses the moniker uh, Lee Henry at the top and in the text, all right? Uh, and of course, this is in, in the uh, response to the State Department. Let's go to the next one. Here's the 201 opening sheet, Lee Henry. And finally, when she was deposed by the House Select Committee. I want to talk about that. <clears throat> In her May 1978 sworn testimony to the HSCA, Edgerton lied three times about why she had changed Oswald's middle name to Henry. All she would say is that maybe she saw the name somewhere else or that she was distracted by pressure. <clears throat> Slide 29. Editors Lee Henry lied to the HSCA. Reading committee staff counsel Michael uh, Goldsmith's deposition of editor is almost painful today, given all the opportunities he had to press her for the truth. And the truth was that editor's biography was a deliberate misrepresentation of Oswald's middle name, and yet another stratagem to find the elusive mole. 
Edgerton did not use the false name four times in a row over a five-week period because she was distracted by pressure or because <coughs> she saw the false name on another document. In fact, the other document, as I showed you, she was looking on that day was Stacy's uh, biography on Oswald. And it had Har Henry, uh, Lee Harvey on that one. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So um, we need to uh, take a deep breath before, because I'm going to get back into the KGB here and take about five minutes for a bathroom break or just straight, stretch your legs. Just time out, let your brain rest. Uh, so as in, in the uh, shakeup, Schleppen takes over the KGB. Uh, and what the, he does, um, adopting a plan uh, that was put together by Igans, who I mentioned before as the, in the um, first chief director at Deception, is to create a new KGB inside of the old KGB. And they don't care after that if, <laughs> if uh, uh, CIA is able to penetrate the old KGB and, and get stuff. It doesn't matter because the old KGB doesn't know anything about these new active measures that uh, Schleppen puts together. So it's a completely different thing. And disinformation, big, big uh, new program. Um, <clears throat> so Schleppen reorganizes the KGB into these two entities. Uh, and it was limited to a small number of trusted officers under the direct su supervision of the Politburo who planned, orchestrated, and controlled and analyzed these new operations. The Schleppen Plan was known as the Active Measures Service, originated from a five-page memorandum authored by Ivan Agayance, the head of KGB disinformation operations for worldwide coordination of clandestine political action. Schleppen adopted Agayance's proposal and the Communist Party Central Committee ordered this mission to be centralized and carried out by a new independent, independent KGB department designated as Department D. Agans was appointed the chief. We'll go back to the default slide. That should be the next one. Zero. No sooner had Agans set up his deception scheme in the uh, department and the first chief director, if you look at your uh, thing there, then Grievenoff, um, uh Oleg Grybunov set up his own deception unit in the second chief directorate, naming it Department 14. Sergei Kondrashev told Pete Bagley, this is after the Cold War, that Grybunov was always out to beat the first chief directorate at his own game. The Department 14 mission statement was mounting complicated counterintelligence operations and operational games to penetrate foreign intelligence services. Grybunov resolved to turn disaster into opportunity by turning Popov's betrayal into a weapon to use against the Americans. Grybunov named this operation Boomerang and assigned it to Department 14. But he had to delay launching Boomerang for two years because of another defection by the most celebrated Western spy during the Cold War. Slide 31. I will now turn to the Penkovsky defection. In April 1961, GRU Colonel Oleg Penkovsky made arrangements through a British businessman visiting Moscow to meet with U.S. and U.K. intelligence officers in London. The defection took place in late April. George Kiesewalter and Joe Bulick of the CIA, along with two MI6 officers, met Penkovsky in a hotel near Hyde Park. After the Cold War ended in 1991, former KGB officers disclosed that they had learned about Penkovsky's defection right away. The leak almost certainly came from a valuable mole in Britain's MI6. As a result, Grybunov was forced to weigh the effects of the Petkoski affair before moving ahead with his Operation Boomerang. This whole thing on Petkoski really shows you the extreme lengths they will go to protect their source. They do not want uh, us to know how uh, we uh, they found out about Petkoski. <clears throat> to protect the mole, Grybunov had no alternative but to risk letting Petkoski share more genuine secrets with his Western handlers. Pinkowski was allowed to go repeatedly uh, to more meetings with joint U.S.-U.K. handling team during a, a trip to London and again in uh, Paris that fall, 1961. Moreover, even after Pinkowski returned to Moscow in October, Grybunov allowed him to pass more information, more important secret documents to American and British embassy officials in Moscow for another year. Pinkowski was not arrested until May 1962 after Finally, after a false surveillance scenario for his arrest had been concocted. By then, Grybunov was satisfied that he had Penkovsky cornered like a bear in his den. 
Penkovsky sensed the impending danger. In August 1962, he wrote that he had grown used to the heavy surveillance and control over his movements. Penkovsky was tried and executed in 1963. Slide 32. Yeah, that's Galitsyn. On 15 December 1961, Major, uh, KGB Major Anatoly Galitsyn defected with his family to the CIA from his post as vi the vice counsel in Helsinki, Finland. Kondrashev recalled that the CIA treated Galitsyn differently from other defectors who were charged to the Soviet Russia division. Galitsyn had become Angleton's personal charge and source. Galitsyn provided information about many famous Soviet agents, including Donald McLean and Guy Burgess. Galitsyn's information proved definitive that the head of the uh, counter-espionage operations in Britain's MI6, Kim Philby, was a Soviet mole. But Galitsyn's most important gift to Western intelligence was his warning about the new Soviet e efforts in the field of disinformatia, Russian for disinformation. Let's go to slide 32A. It means a systematic effort to disseminate false information, to distort or withhold information, to misrepresent the real communist policies, to confuse, deceive, and influence the non-communist world, to jeopardize Western policies, and to induce Western adversaries to contribute unwittingly to the achievement of communist objectives. Kalitsyn was also able to assist the CIA in its most challenging endeavor, spotting the difference between genuine and false defectors. The Soviet Russia division used him to identify other potential defectors in the Soviet diplomatic corps. Galitsyn immediately rang alarm bells by revealing that the KGB had discovered Popov's treason in 1957. Galitsyn warned the CIA about the early post-war treason of an American code clerk in Moscow that he could only identify as Jack. We'll get to him at the end of my presentation. A very interesting story. And in 1962, the head of the second chief director, Oleg... What did I just miss here? Okay. In 1962, uh, Grebenov sent Yuri Nisenko to the CIA to discredit Galitsyn's important leads. <clears throat> Slide 32. And I'll turn to Sergei Kondrashev. As I mentioned in my brief introduction, uh, he was a hot ticket. Everybody wanted him to work in deception. During the late summer of 1961, the acting chief in Vienna, Kondrashev, hosted an important visitor from Moscow, Ivan Agayans. Head of the, he was the head of the KGB's first chief director of disinformation operations and also one of the most respected officers in the history of Soviet intelligence. Agayans explained that his main focus was sowing division in Germany. At that time, the world was in the grip of the Cold War crisis over Berlin. I have a whole chapter on Berlin crisis in 1961 in, in volume three. And Agayans wanted a senior colleague with the right background for that region. He had worked with Kondrashev when the latter was deputy chief of the German department from 55 to 57. Knowing that the end of Sergei's tour in Vienna was approaching, Agayans invited him to Moscow as his deputy, and Sergei readily accepted the offer. In early 62, Kondrashev returned to Moscow. Before reporting for duty as Agayans' deputy, in February, Kondrashev received an invitation to visit the head of the second chief director, Oleg Grebenov. Grebenov knew of Kondrashev nine years of experience in the second directorate, and that he was about to join Agayans' high-level deception work as his deputy in the first directorate. Grebenov told Kondrashev that he was in the process of launching a complex deception operation against the CIA, and he wanted Kondrashev to help him run it. If Sergei would return to the second directorate for this purpose, Grebenov said he would make him his deputy with the rank of a one-star general. Default slide. Agayans already knew about the complex operation Grebenov was preparing and advised Kondrashev to reject his offer. Agayans warned that Grebenov would screw up the operation because he was too rash and would not spend enough time for the necessary detailed preparations. Kondrashev took Agayans' advice and turned down Grebenov. Grebenov did go ahead with his complex deception, and Kondrashev accidentally discovered the key details about the operation, including who Grebenov was sending to deceive the CIA and the identity of the officer who was managing the operation in the field. Here's how that happened. In May 1962, Kondrashev bumped into an old second director friend, Yuri Avenovich Guk. That's one of the three names I asked you to put down on your piece of paper there. Kondrashev knew that Guk was stationed in Switzerland and asked what he was doing in Moscow. Happy to see his old friend, Guk replied that he was just in town to discuss an operation and was enjoying life, uh, the pleasures of life in Geneva. 
he added that he was having a lot of fun partying there with Yuri Nosenko. Knowing that Nosenko was only a minor second director at headquarters officer, Kondrashev asked what in the world Nosenko was doing in Geneva. Guk froze as he realized the indiscretion he had just committed. He asked Kondrashev to forget that he'd ever mentioned it. Kondrashev was aware that Guk was a longtime expert in counterintelligence deception and still working as an officer in the uh, second chief directorate. Obviously, Guk and Nosenko were part of Grivanov's grand deception plan. The identity of the officer that Grivanov was sending to deceive the CIA in Geneva was Yuri Nosenko. And the identity of the officer that Grivanov was sending to manage the operation of the field was Ivan Guk. <coughs> Slide 35, 35. Welcome to the world of Yuri Nosenko. Just three months after Griebmanoff told Kondrashev he was launching a provocation against the CIA, a minor counterintelligence officer from Moscow was temporarily assigned as a watchdog for a Soviet delegation to a disarmament conference in Geneva. During that conference, he did something that would forever play a central role in the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy. At the end of May 1962, in Geneva, Switzerland, Yuri Nosenko volunteered to spy for the CIA. And, as fate would have it, Pete Bagley was the CIA officer who received Nosenko's offer to defect in place, meaning that he would remain based in the Soviet <laughs> Union. Defecting in place is a far more dangerous and harrowing arrangement than simply hightailing it to safety in America. On the other hand, if the defection is a deception, then doing it in the U.S. is the more dangerous arrangement. Two days before Nosenko walked into Pete Bagley's apartment overlooking Old Town of Geneva, Nosenko approached an American diplomat that he knew had served in Moscow and asked him for immediate help to contact the CIA. The American quickly got the message to Bagley's supervisor after escorting Nosenko to the apartment, and he disappeared. Nosenko brushed aside any introductory pleasantries and said straight away that he had important things to tell Bagley and that he urgently needed money. Nosenko announced that he was an officer in the KGB's second chief directorate, and is responsible for the security of the Soviet delegation at the Geneva Conference. Bagley poured Nosenko a second glass of whiskey as the Russian acknowledged he was doing something dangerous. But he needed money quickly. Nosenko lamented that he had been in too many bars with too many girls and drank too much whiskey. Nosenko said he and his drinking partner, Yuri Guk, a longtime friend of an old, an, on an old assignment of the Soviet intelligence station in Switzerland, were having a great time together. However, it was near the end of his three-month stay in Geneva, and the time had come. Nosenko had to account for his finances. He explained that he didn't mind speaking with Bagley because he didn't believe in the Soviet system anymore. Nosenko asked for 800 francs. That was a curiously small sum for a defection, about $250. <coughs> Nosenko promised to answer all of Bagley's questions, but insisted he would never, never go to America because he would not leave his wife and two daughters in Russia. Nosenko then made a big mistake. Impulsively, he gave up a piece of information that would eventually come back to haunt him. While showing Bagley photographs of his two daughters, he said, Look, I just got these for my wife. Gook was back in Moscow for a few days, and my wife asked him to bring them to me. Later, at CIA headquarters, Gook's quick trip to Moscow at this particular moment would invite suspicion. Slide 36. Good. All right. When Bagley <coughs> asked if Nosenko would be missed during meetings at Bagley's apartment, he blundered again. He said, quote, I don't have any fixed duties in the conference, and no one knows who cares if I come and go. I'm not accountable to anyone. I'm not staying with the rest of the delegation. They're in the hotel Rex, but four of us are in another hotel. Not even close. The only person who really knows how I spend my time is Gook. But he's my friend. No problem. Not staying with the delegation he was supposed to be watching was outside of standard KGB protocol. <clears throat> that was one thing. Bragging about it to a CIA case officer was something else. A rookie gaffe. 37, please. We're Good. When Bagley asked who the three people in Nosenko's hotel were and if they would notice his absences, Nosenko's thoughtless reply was his third mistake. Absolutely not. The guy sharing my room is just a journalist with nothing to do with the KGB. Same for the other two. Bagley asked for the name of, the, of his journalist roommate. Instead of using a pseudonym, Nosenko blurted out his true name, Alexander Kislov. 
number two in your down bottom left hand corner. Kislov, Gook, and Kofschak are the three musketeers. <clears throat> Nosenko had just bluntly lied to Bagley about who Kislov was. As I mentioned in the Kondrasev section of my presentation before, Gook worked for the KGB in Grivinov's second chief directorate, and so did Kislov in the director's deception department. Whether or not Bagley knew it right away, later at headquarters, that journalist invention would join the many other howlers that Nosenko made during his professed defection in Geneva. Bagley asked Nosenko to describe his job in Moscow. The reply was his fourth mistake in as many minutes. He said that until a few weeks before leaving for Geneva, he had been the number two man in the section operating against the American embassy in Moscow, slide 38. Years later, no less than four highly authoritative, authoritative KGB officers would state that Nosenko had not held that position. And you can just look at it. I'm not going to read it to save time. But it's you know, Galitsyn and Markov, Kondrashev and Kalugin, big, big names. Slide 39, please the most important American spy. Hold on a second, I'm trying to get this. Uh... Yeah. When Bagley asked Nosenko for the most important thing he could tell the CIA, Nosenko boasted that he personally knew the most important American spy that the KGB had ever recruited in Moscow, codenamed Andre. Nosenko identified this spy as an army sergeant cipher machine mechanic who had worked in the American embassy. Begley asked if there was anything more that might help the CIA identify Andre and when he had been recruited. Nusenko replied it was 1949 or 50 or one or the other. That was a lie intended to put a mere cipher mechanic into the shoes of the true, most important spy, a code clerk who had been recruited in 1949 by Kondrashev, by the way, and who had done the most devastating damage to the security of American military communications in the Cold War. And I'll get back to Andre's commitment shortly and the espionage of the code clerk. Back to the default slide. Nosenko was one of several poison pills working for Grebenov's Operational Deception Section, Department 14. And as Igayans had warned Kondrashev, Grebenov's grand deception plan was rash and lacked the detailed preparations for it to succeed. The reason Nosenko could not go to America was not because he would miss his family. Rather, it was because his own story would have fallen apart. That is exactly what happened when, in desperation after Kennedy was killed, Nosenko was forced to go to America for good. Apparently, in 1962, no one in Moscow had imagined such an outcome would ever occur. When Bagley cabled CIA headquarters about Nosenko's defection in Geneva, the reply came back within hours. The headquarters file on Nosenko was virtually empty. It had only one note about a single Caribbean trip with the Soviet group. There was nothing on him personally, nor had any other KGB, KGB defector ever mentioned his name. In early June 1962, with only a week to go before the disarmament conference ended, George Keyes of Walter joined Bagley for four additional meetings with Nosenko. Oddly, his conference security duties were virtually non-existent again. During one of those meetings, Nosenko gave the two CIA men the account earlier contrived by the KGB about how Popoff had been discovered. Now in Geneva, Nosenko backstopped the KGB's routine surveillance excuse for Popoff's arrest. The truth was that the KGB had learned from their mole in the CIA about Popoff's treason in January 1957, three years before the false routine surveillance script was prepared by the KGB in 1959 and now vouched for again by Nosenko in 1962. In this meeting, Nosenko made more improvised boasts about his previous job before letting loose with this whopper. We never managed to recruit any American code clerk. The closest we ever came was Andre. Nosenko's obvious inability to improvise under the influence of Scott shows how accurate Agayan's prediction was, that Grebenov's grand deception scheme would be sloppy and flawed by a lack of preparation. Now, probably at the direction of Gook, upon learning of Nosenko's pitiful Andre performance at the previous meeting, Nosenko squirmed to walk back his Andre tale. Nosenko's supposed role in Andre's recruitment was now subtly shifted into another story about never recruiting any American code clerks. Now Andre was only a best try in an otherwise disappointing story of the continuing failure of the KGB and Moscow operations against American code clerks. Nosenko was lucky for the time being to get away with this. Bagley did not press again for the recruitment date, nor question why Andre was, uh, was so important after all. Still hidden by this attempted sleight of hand was Kondrashev's 
1949 successful recruitment of an American code clerk in Moscow whose code name was Jack, not Entree. And I'll get back to Jack shortly, too. During the final meeting with Nosenko, communication signals were worked out to ensure that he could let the CIA know uh, when he would be in the West the next time. That would not take place until just a few weeks after the assassination of President Kennedy. In the interim, the CIA would discover that Nosenko was not who he pretended to be at the 1962 Geneva, uh, Convention in Geneva.